Pretty good. Okay, come on, raise it up. Raise it up. Hey, good. We're going to have some honor to in this room. we got to say welcome to Congressman Courtney. I just want to say it is a pleasure and a privilege to introduce Congressman Courtney to all of you because he is a champion for Eastern Connecticut, and I think his congressional record shows what he has done here in southeastern Connecticut and eastern Connecticut, especially his driving force between um, monies and funding for electric boat, which for the next 30 years will guarantee the economic development of eastern Connecticut. And that's something that we should be very, very proud of. So let's give comments. <laughs> For Blue Rivers Community College and our workforce and continuing education department that Marge Valentine, Marge, please stand up, heads up. <laughs> and Dean Fenton, please stand up. <laughs> we here at Three Rivers have made the commitment to be partners with Electric Boat, working with Congressman Courtney on the Eastern Investment Workforce, John Beauregard. And the reason I share that with all of you is because it's really important that we work together to build our communities, to educate our citizenry so that our communities are thriving, that we have representatives in Congress like Congressman Courtney who believe in the people of this region and who are tireless in fighting for laws, for funding that is going to make our communities better. So I just want to salute you, Congressman Courtney, for all you do. I want to thank DivaCon Bureau for arranging to have Congressman Courtney here. He started the day off at uh, Quinnebog Valley Community College this morning. And so he's had a full and far-reaching day, as they say in diplomatic circles. So without further ado, <laughs> let's turn it over to Congressman Courtney. And before Congressman Courtney um, speaks, I would like to just say that Congressman Courtney has been a friend of mine in the Environmental Engineering Technology Program for many years. And he has stood by us. He's out in the river with us, holding a net, as you can see. He's been, to, uh, he's been with my students at my house um, a couple years ago. And he's always been really supportive of, of my program and my students. And so um, we all love Congress and Courtney. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got nowhere to go but downhill. <laughs> well, it's very kind introductions. And, um, you know, I want to thank Diva for the invitation uh, to be here. As she said, you know, we um, obviously um, stayed in touch and communicated and worked together uh, along with other programs here at Three Rivers Community College, uh, which were mentioned. And um, and I just want to, again, really kind of foot stomp a, a point that, you know, in which, which we were just talking about is that the um, her program, Diva's program, uh, you know, which is focused on environmental engineering and design and, um, you know, sort of practical application of um, you know, what I think is a passion that many of the students and certainly she has in terms of ways that you know, we can sort of help grow uh, the country in a sustainable way, um, you know, has real practical, real life value. And, and um, this morning, actually before we went to QVCC, um, we actually had a stop up at a, a dairy farm up in Enfield, uh, the Collins Dairy Farm, which um, we saw like just an amazing example of that, which is uh, it's, a, it's a dairy farm that's been around for a really long time. You know, milk prices right now, if you look, uh, have really kind of slid downwards in a pretty scary way, particularly for um, you know parts of the country that have high, high input costs in terms of feed and, and particularly energy. So we were there to visit uh, actually a really exciting project, um, which the U.S. Department of Energy um, helped partially fund, which was. Um, they set up a, a very kind of strikingly simple um, device, uh, which is basically generates heat from compost. And, and it, it's, uh, they, they basically pile up the compost in these sort of um, little sections with pipes that run through it with holes in it. Um, and then as the compost, as you know, uh, heats up, which that's what Mother Nature does with it, um, it basically generates a flow of heat 
into this unit, which uh, you know has some real sort of pretty cool science with it in terms of how it converts it um, into um, uh, a pumping system and water heater system, which then goes out to the milking barn. And, and because of um, that very simple um, investment, uh, it actually is reducing uh, the amount of propane that he has to use to heat the barn during, during the winter. So instead, instead of having to you know, heat uh, a building that is you know, a pretty simple shed, from you know, take take your pick, you know, below freezing temperature to um, a, a level that you can, you know, the cows and everyone is safe and healthy, um, you know, which is a big uh, delta uh, to get to that point. By having that heat pumped in from the, the compost, uh, you're reducing the delta to a very like low cost, manageable um, uh, cost for for the farm, which helps them be more sustainable uh, over a period of time. The program, the U.S. Department of Energy, it, it's actually uh, based out in Co uh, Golden, Colorado. It's the National uh, Renewable Energy Institute, which is uh, something that actually Jimmy Carter um, started uh, you know, during the first energy crisis. And they just do this very sort of smart, cutting edge um, research into ways to, again, have practical application of renewable energy so that a little dairy farm up in Enfield, Connecticut, with a very modest um, investment, which he has to match, by the way, it's not free. Um, you know, can really kind of help get through this very difficult patch in terms of falling dairy prices and, and um, you know, keep his, his operation going, which he and his family um, are very proud of. So, um, you know, again, that, that's just sort of an example of how, you know, really smart people who, you know, care about um, non-fossil fuel-based uh, energy generation can come up with really smart ways and ideas to, um, you know, make their businesses more efficient in a place like New England. Uh, a week or so ago, I was up in Town, Connecticut. I live up in Vernon, and, and um, the town's the next town over. And there's a, a company there, CNC um, Design, I think is the name of it. But anyway, they do software design. They are a supplier into EV, actually, and many other um, you know, big uh, manufacturers and defense manufacturers. Born owned business, 200 employees. Um, you know, the place was actually voted uh, one of the best workplaces in Connecticut uh, this year, a, a poll that the Harvard Current uh, did. And um, anyway, I mean, really smart people coming up with this, you know, great um, software systems that they sell to, to, you know, names that you would know, big brand name companies in manufacturing around the country there. But what they were really most proud about is that they wanted to take me around the facility and show they have a zero carbon emission um, structure. And it's just, uh, you know, these, they're all engineers, so they're, you know, the smart guys. And, uh, but I mean, they really, they, they have been starting this process with solar panels and geothermal and conservation and, um, and it, you know, have just kind of steadily but surely kind of whittled down the carbon emission um, to the point where it's zero. And, and, um, and again, for them, that's money in their pocket, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, again, having a sustainable uh, business model. So again, I just thought, you know, just sort of a couple real small examples in, in back home here in Eastern Connecticut where people who, uh, again, obviously uh, are very passionate about uh, trying to find out, find ways for, for uh, you know, uses of renewable energy um, are doing great things, not just for, you know, the globe, but also, uh, frankly, for sustainable long-term uh, business growth here in the region. So, um, and again, th there's other examples. The Navy base in Groton is one of the greenest, um, you know, installations in the, in the Navy, you know, in terms of the geothermal and, and panels that they put in over there. You know, they're upgrading in, in terms of just uh, tightening their, their uh, conservation efforts out there. Um, well, former Secretary of the Navy, uh, Ray Mavis, that was a high, high priority for him to, to really get the, the Navy green. And, and you know, there, again, there's another example sort of locally of, of sort of what's going on. But anyway, I, um, you know, just we, we talked about sort of, uh, you know, where we are today and sort of what's, what's going on in Washington. And, um, you know, that's where things get a little more challenging in terms of some of the, the public policy choices that are happening uh, right down there. And, and obviously, um, you know, it's uh, one of the issues that I think is going to be on the ballot 11 days from now, which is, uh, I think, a pretty critical moment for the country. Uh, there's obviously a whole host of issues like net neutrality, uh, you know, student loan and uh, college affordability that are also on the ballot, health care, uh, you know, budget, taxes. Uh, but there's no question that um, the environment and uh, you know the whole issue of climate change is very very much uh, front and center on the ballot. And um, you know what I would just say is that um, you know 
know, having been in Congress now uh, in my 12th year, uh, you know, I, I sort of was there when we tried to put a, a, a price on carbon emissions with the cap and trade uh, program that was voted on in 2009, right after President Obama was elected. Um, you know, it had its critics, even amongst people who were um, supporters of climate change uh, legislation, but the fundamental sort of goal of putting a price on carbon emissions is, is a way of, again, trying to sort of bend the curve in a, in a direction where um, it would create new incentives to, to reduce uh, carbon emissions. Unfortunately, it failed in the Senate um, to sort of get to the 60 vote uh, uh, threshold for a filibuster, and as a result, that effort kind of um, you know, just stalled out, unfortunately. Um, and, uh, but there were other initiatives that were sort of moving forward, both administratively by the administration, the Clean Power Plant um, uh, rule, which uh, again, did sort of similar things, not quite as comprehensively as the cap and trade bill, but in terms of trying to change incentives for carbon emissions in terms of power production in the country. Again, about 30% of the carbon emissions come from, from uh, generation of power, so it's a big, part of the pie chart if you're trying to you know, get things sort of uh, headed in a different direction. Um, the uh, administrator for the Environmental Protection Agency, which sort of quarterbacked um, that whole effort, was actually somebody we know well in Connecticut, Gina McCarthy. She was EPA administrator under both of Republican and Democratic uh, administrations in this region. She served under Jody Rell um, when, when, she, when Jody, a Republican, was governor of Connecticut, and, uh, and then did such a good job, President Obama appointed her uh, to, to do it. So again, it definitely was gonna sort of try and move um, power production away from dirtier uh, sources, uh, more fossil-based, uh, fossil fuel-based sources, and try and again, uh, create a, a structure of incentives uh, in, in, a, in a different way, in a different direction. She is a really impressive person. If we could ever get her to come down here, I think you'd really, um, you know, really enjoy her. Um, she was fearless in terms of going out across the country to sort of um, talk to groups about her, her plan. Um, I talked to a congressman from Houston, Texas, which is at the center of uh, the oil patch, I guess you'd call it, in, in the U.S. And Gina went down to the uh, uh, U.S. Uh, or American uh, Oil and Natural Gas Annual Convention to speak to them about the Clean Power Plant. And uh, the congressman, who's a, a friend of mine, Gene Green, said, you know, we were worried about her, you know, sort of walking into this room because, you know, this is the, the group that uh, would have been, um, you know, considered the most hostile to what she was trying to do. But, you know, she was so persuasive and so um, organized in terms of the, the package that she was presenting um, that she actually got a standing ovation when she ended up doing her, her presentation. And, um, you know, what, what's tragic about the fact that the Trump administration is canceling uh, this program is just that, you know, the, the energy industry was actually starting to really adjust to this. I mean, that, that's really, government should not be like, you know, a power producer, except in, you know, limited circumstances, I think, but, but it can create incentives <coughs> to sort of, you know, move the market and change um, the way uh, behavior, whether it's, the, you know, transportation with uh, uh, fuel efficiency standards, you know, which require cars and trucks to, to do better in terms of use of fossil fuels or move towards electric, um, or uh, the, the clean power plant rule, which was really uh, aimed at trying to you know, move us away from coal and, and more into natural gas, which burns cleaner, um, and, and then obviously with renewable energy as sort of the real um, you know, way that you can dramatically shift um, the, the, the needle in terms of fossil fuel. So that was that. that unfortunately, uh, the president issued an order, um, you know, canceling the uh, clean power plant rule. I mentioned fuel efficiency standards again. Those were uh, started under the Carter and Reagan uh, administrations, which uh, again was a push to, to Detroit and to the car manufacturers. Because um, I'm old enough to remember, and I think maybe a couple of us in the room here, that you know, back in the day, you know, in the 60s and 70s, a uh, Corvette. Um, Stingray, you know, you got basically eight miles to a gallon <laughs> when you were driving. You know, they're really cool cars and really nice looking, but obviously uh, that was actually not that um, different from many, many other vehicles that were on the road. So basically, you know, setting a higher and higher standard over time um, forced Detroit to get more innovative in terms of the weight of cars, uh, obviously the engine technology, and, um, 
and we've seen great advances in obviously the ultimate, which is just a totally non-fossil fuel driven uh, vehicles with uh, either hybrids or, or Teslas, you know, the, the, the uh, electric. So the last um, rule for uh, fuel efficiency standards would have pushed the, it's now roughly, you know, in the 20s and 30s, you know, miles per gallon in terms of what, um, you know, they have to adhere to to sell a, a, vehicle, a new vehicle in this country. It would have pushed it actually over time closer to 40 or 50 miles per gallon, again, depending on, um, you know, whether it's a car or truck. And uh, again, that was rolled back, um, you know, by the administration recently, which again, what, what's unfortunate is that the car manufacturers actually signed off on that higher standard. I mean, they, and, and they, of course they are, because that's what the rest of the world's auto manufacturers are doing in Europe and China and India now. And, you know, it's, it's a global um, marketplace in terms of uh, automobile and truck production. So, um, you know, in many respects, they're going to have to do it anyway. And, um, uh, but having those fuel efficiency standards is always that sort of a baseline that really make sure that you know the fleet of cars that are driving out in America's roads and highways is, is uh, moving in the right direction. And so that, unfortunately, uh, was, was rolled back. Um, so you know those are two things that I think really are on the ballot, because uh, if, frankly, the control of Congress uh, changes, you're going to see pushes to, to restore those initiatives by statute, by law. As I said, the, the, uh, the, both of those were done by administrative uh, agency executive branch just signing an order to get to, to move uh, power plants and, and car uh, production in those directions but we can do that as a Congress I mean that nothing says that we can't enact um, standards uh, it, it frankly is a little clunky to do that but, you know by Congress it, it's really better in my opinion to have it with uh, you know uh, administrative agencies and unfortunately you know if you look at it historically in the case of fuel efficiency standards it didn't matter if it was Democrat or Republican administrations in terms of just a march upward in terms of fuel efficiency standards, but, but you know, we're obviously dealing a somewhat um, different time uh, right now in terms of uh, that kind of decision making that, that sort of uh, really cast aside what was a bipartisan uh, precedent that, um, as I said, even industry, um, you know, sort of uh, joined up with. Um, you know, there um, are a whole host of other um, initiatives out there that, um, you know, we're, we're obviously watching very closely and, and that Congress has done, I think, good things on. So if you look at sort of some of the solar panels, if you're driving around uh, your town or in the area there, and there's been a really pretty impressive growth of uh, solar panels, partly because the technology's gotten a lot better and the cost of panels has come down. But another big piece of that was that, is that Uncle Sam, the federal government, um, gave a helping hand in terms of the cost of, of installation. It's about a third. Um, you get a renewable energy tax credit. A tax credit, again, is not a deduction which reduces your taxable income. A tax credit is, is cash money that you get back in your pocket. And so um, that tax credit, which was passed a, a few years ago, if you talk to some of the, the companies that install uh, solar panels, and there's a pretty healthy competition right now out there in the marketplace. If you or your family ever, you know, kind of want to decide you want to kind of shop around, I mean, you can shop around. I mean, there, there really are a number of, of uh, companies and firms now that are really competing with each other, which is good in terms of driving um, the price down. But all of them sort of build that federal energy, excuse me, renewable energy tax credit, which is out of Washington, into their prices. And, and so as a result, you can get leasing deals or you can get, or you can just buy it outright and take the cash yourself personally. But it has made it much, much more affordable in terms of installation. So um, the Department of Energy actually puts out a, uh, a report every year. It's kind of like a census of employment in the energy sector, state by state. It's pretty interesting sort of uh, things that kind of track in terms of what's going on out there. And what's interesting, in terms of jobs right now in, in, in Connecticut, in the energy sector, actually the renewable is higher than fossil fuels. I mean, and that includes even the fuel delivery guys, you know, that are out there right now, which, you know, I still, get my home heating oil up and burn it there as well, and they're good people, and, and I, you know, they, they work hard for their living. But the fact of the matter is, is that a, a company like Earthlight, which is a, a solar panel company up in Ellington, Connecticut, who has gone from zero to about 60 employees, um, you know, that's where the, the job growth is. So again, you know, that federal energy um, tax credit 
which if you talk to them, you know, the, the folks who are out there selling solar panels, that is really the tipping point for people in terms of when they look at their budget and try to figure out whether or not that's an investment <coughs> that they want to make. The, the Federal uh, Renewable Energy Tax Credit is going to expire uh, in about another year or two. And it would, in my opinion, it would really um, you know, seize up the momentum uh, that we're seeing build up in terms of solar panels if that is allowed to just terminate. And, um, and I know that <laughs> because uh, when we extended it last time, uh, it had actually expired for about a month or two. It was at the end of the uh, calendar year, and then we voted in a lame duck session to extend it. And I was talking to um, a, a guy, Art Linares, who some of you may know, he's a state senator um, out there, but his family owns owned a, a solar panel business, Earth Skies. And, um, and when he said, and he said, when the renewable energy tax credit was about to expire, they were actually getting ready to lay off um, a large number of uh, people at the company there because they knew that the, the orders were just going to dry up. And then when we extended it in, in December, and I can't remember exactly what year it was, it was like 12 or 11, something like that. But um, uh, they actually decided to have a big Christmas party <laughs> <you> know, instead <laughs> because uh, they were there to celebrate because they, you know, it, it saved their jobs. Right. Um, to have that, and um, you know, and that's smart tax policy. It's very targeted. You know, you're trying to get a goal to achieve, which in this case was to promote and, and, and uh, strengthen uh, solar installation in homes. And um, and again, the homeowner still has to pony up. It's not a freebie um, that's out there right now. But over time, I mean, the return on investment when you make those kinds of uh, investments and decisions in terms of reduced um, light bills and, and heating bills. Um, you know, it's just, you're gonna make it back in, 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 in spades. And, and I um, was at the, um, when we were at the farm this morning, actually with the Department of Energy, they had the, the sheet sort of worked out in terms of how much it cost uh, <coughs> Alan's family who, who uh, installed that compost um, and, and just what the savings were in terms of diesel, and propane, and um, you know, some of the other uh, costs that were associated with how the farm operated before. And the, and the return on investment was 1.7 years, which is incredible. I mean, less than two years' time, they were already in the black in terms of the savings that was putting money um, into their pocket. Solar panels take a little longer if you, if you talk to people. It's, uh, but, the, but again, there's no question that that tax credit really um, shortens that, that window uh, for, for people in terms of whether or not it's a, it's a good decision to make. So, um, so again, I don't want to filibuster here uh, this <laughs> evening. I mean, I can take a, a, a few questions. Um, you know, the Paris Climate Change Agreement, I, I'll just sort of end with that, which is, um, you know, when we talk about an issue like carbon emissions, um, you, know, um, you know, Mother Nature doesn't know boundaries. You know, I mean, it's, you, sometimes when you're talking about, you know, raising the temperature of the planet, um, you, you've got to really sort of collaborate um, with the rest of the world if you're going to really try and achieve uh, a goal that um, is, is going to be meaningful. And um, the, the Paris uh, Agreement, which had, I think, every single country in the world, with the exception of like Syria, I think was the only one that had to sign on to it, um, you know, was actually a great achievement. Some people criticize it for not being strong enough, but the fact is, is trying to get 187 countries or so together on any document is, uh, you know, it is the ultimate herding of cats. And, um, and, it, and it created a framework for measurement, at least, which is really important in terms of just you know, trying to understand where we're going. The U.S. withdrew from the, the Paris uh, Agreement, which is still about a year off. It, it, can't, it didn't happen right there on the spot. Um, obviously, one of the biggest um, energy consumers and producers um, really, you know, it, it was it was it really hurt in terms of trying to move that forward. It, the the Congress can't sort of um, unilaterally <coughs> have the country back into that, but we can certainly try and, you know, like de facto. Participate in the, in the Paris Agreement by promoting uh, green energy uh, policies, and, and and to the skeptics of, of you know the Paris Agreement, what I would just say is, again, back in the day, and this was a while ago, the country, the world was facing a crisis in terms of its ozone layer. Um, there, there was uh, this chemical called chlorofluorocarbons, which was in refrigerants, it was in hairspray, and you know deodorant spray, and and you know it was actually really good in terms of trying to make these gadgets. Uh, you know, work, but the problem is, is chlorofluorocarbons, and, and Dave Bingham can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I'm right, you know, actually was causing damage 
to the ozone of, um, in the atmosphere, and it was something that you know was scientifically in, you know, beyond dispute. And the, the world came together with an international treaty that basically banned the use of, of chloral, chlor chlorocarbons, and, and actually the, the atmosphere healed um, in the wake of that. So it shows that global action, um, and that's a, just a real sort of simple concrete acid brain, you know, you can point to other examples where, um, you know, when, when people look at the science, understand it, understand there's a problem, and then come together to try and solve it, um, you, you actually get real results that, um, make sometimes the, the pessimists out there who think that you know it's all sort of hopeless. Um, really, they're not right. You know, we can we can with with um, you know people who uh, you know do the homework and you guys are doing that. Um, you know, move the needle in a, in a positive direction and solve problems. And so you know that's why I think you know personally I feel this this what, what happens 11 days from now is a pretty big deal <laughs> in terms of whether or not we're we're going to sort of get our at least arms back around. This problem with some of the initiatives that I just described here. So with that, if you want, I can open up to some questions or. Questions, yes, I know that some of them have questions. Yeah. yeah. So I have two. My first one is, what are our plans to do with the municipal solid waste after we close our landfills in Connecticut? So again, that's a, a it's a, it's an issue that's going to have to be dealt with um, certainly at the state uh, level. Again, there's um, uh, you know a facility um, in uh, Plainfield. Which has been taking solid waste and, and burning it, and, you know, purportedly burning it clean um, to, to sort of dispose of it uh, that way, and and you know again there's there's challenges with burning it, you know, because it's just you're creating you know possibly other types of emissions, mm -hmm. uh, but deep you know the uh, Department of Energy and Environmental Policy has been really um, you know on them you know intensely in terms of making sure that that's the case, so. Um, you know, but we're, we're, we're going to have to, you know, I think really need good, smart people like, you know, people in this room to come up with uh, ways. I mean, recycling obviously is another sort of option, but uh, there's limits um, to that in terms of just uh, you know, how much the market will absorb in terms of recycled materials. We can do better than what we're doing right now, that's for sure. The use of plastics, uh, I think, is also about to hit a, a tipping and almost crisis point. You know, the old Union Carbide that's down in Ledyard, I was down there where they've been producing plastics for many, many years down there. Since China announced that they're not going to take um, our plastic anymore, which happened really just in calendar 2018, that industry is in crisis right now. They've got to come up with a solution to this, or it's just, you know, we're, we're, there's, just, there's just nothing you can do with it. Um, and, you know, China was taking it from, for a long, long time countries like the U.S. and, and they kind of hit their uh, saturation point in terms of just saying no more. And, and so um, they're, they're like, that whole industry, the plastics industry right now is in, engaged in almost like a crash, you know, Manhattan project for plastic in terms of uh, ways that they, they're going to have to come up with recycling it or, or they're just, you know, because we should not have to absorb the costs of, of you know, what's left over afterwards if they can't, if we can't do anything with it. And then my second question, with the amount of people who are growing more concerned about having green energy in their homes, are there plans to mandate public utilities like NPU to allow homeowners, young and old, to allow them to access green energy options? Because I know Eversource right now is working with Trinity, and they're doing like free solar panel installations if you have Eversource. Well, my boyfriend and I, we just recently bought a house in Norwich and we asked NPU if they had the same thing. And they said they're in uh, they're in contract right now. But do we have any plan to mandate these public utilities to allow homeowners to have the option to go green or not? So again, I don't follow the state uh, public utility authority, you know, like I do maybe some of the agencies in Washington. Um, but, you know, all I can tell you is that, you know, as a public utility, um, if anything, they have more of a public mission to, to you know, accommodate um, customers like yourself to, to, to do that. Um, you know, I, I do know that uh, one way of, of also that we could do a little better here in, in Connecticut is uh, net metering, uh, which is a, a way of selling back power to the grid, which um, uh, other states have been much more aggressive. Germany uh, is a country that's been much more aggressive than the US. And so in other words, if you generate power that you're not using, in Germany, you sell it back to the grid. You actually 
get back um, not just the wholesale cost, but the actual consumer cost in terms of, of power, which really, when I, when I talked about that window on return of investment, I mean, that, that's like almost instantaneous once you turn your panels on in a country like that. And there's been a, you know people pushing for that in Hartford you know, to get Connecticut to sort of move more in that direction. Uh, obviously, the, the utilities aren't crazy uh, about that because you know, it, it's, it's more money out of their pocket. It's there. But the fact of the matter is, is that's a workable system. That it, it is not pie in the sky to say that you know, we, if you're generating power, why shouldn't you get paid the same uh, you know, price that, that the power companies are selling uh, to their customers? You know, pretty, uh, and, and in Germany, actually, you get back double, which is so that, that you get a premium back for, for selling it to the grid. So those are all great issues that, you know, again, it's not just Washington, it's also here at Hartford. Yeah. Um, thank you for being here. Yeah. Um, this is related to that, and uh, forgive me if I'm not knowing, but um, I haven't heard about the option for solar power or uh, alternate options for uh, people who live in apartments. And I don't know if, is that in the, is that, uh, actually, are there you know reductions for l landlords and um, people or corporations? Well, well the tax credit. Yeah, yeah, I mean the tax credit that I described, which really is the big, you know, right. sort of carrot that's exactly. out there right now. Um, but it's it's really to the it's to the property owner and to the and to the user, you know, which in this case you know, obviously would be the landlord. So um, so I mentioned uh, Groton. I mean, if you drive around and look at Navy housing. Yep. Down there, which is actually privately owned now. The, the Navy doesn't own the uh, okay. Navy housing there. Um, but the property owner, which is a property management company out of Boston, they, they have every single unit of Navy housing now has solar. Uh, because again, and they, and they use those credits. It, it wasn't okay. like you know, the government, um, like the you know, military gave them that, that. I mean, they just decided that that really made sense for them in terms of. Um, I didn't you know, know how widespread that is or if it's the well, incentive for landlords. Well, again, a third of the cost is a pretty good incentive, for, in right. my opinion, for right. any property owner. But whether or not, you know, again, at the end of the day, that's a it's a choice that someone has to make. I just wanted to comment on that, that there are also state incentives to add to the federal incentive. Uh, the Clean Energy Fund, uh, part of every bill that everybody pays goes into a fund, um, which will help subsidize You were talking before about uh, um, incentives that, that you can do to have people um, do it. It seems to uh, that uh, one of the things that's happening is uh, some movement more to, to uh, plant-based plant agriculture. There's another type of agriculture that, uh, for instance, uh, uh, I was wondering if, if you knew anything about the uh, movement towards uh, allowing hemp to be growing. Uh, going hay for cows, but now we're not, uh, a lot of the areas like the farm I grew up on is gone, but those fields are there, they're still producing hay, but it's uh, it's going to, uh, to animal-based uh, consumption, and, and uh, it would be nice to have incentives to transfer to, uh, to more crops. Uh, we don't uh, grow a lot of soybeans in, the, in this state, but uh, So actually, industrial hemp is some pretty encouraging um, movement in Washington right now. So um, in the 2014 Farm Bill, um, we actually opened the door to use of industrial hemp much wider, um, which uh, would take it out of the schedule FDA restriction, which has been kind of ridiculous because you'd have to smoke a whole field of industrial hemp <laughs> to get you know, any kind of reaction to it. Um, but, it but it just you know got sort of swept up in the cannabis sort of bucket you know, in terms of It allowed states to set up um, growing programs through their um, their uh, land grant college of agriculture, um, and it didn't have to be on the campus. I mean, they could just they could supervise it off campus in different places. Um, much to my frustration, um, Connecticut really just did not really pursue it, and, and it, it's, it drives me crazy because Virginia, Kentucky, which are big tobacco states. Yeah. Where their tobacco farmers are, you know, seeing, you know, that 
product sort of go south in the marketplace. <coughs> they moved into industrial hemp using the pilot program in a big way. And um, in New York, actually, Cuomo uh, rolled it out about two years ago. Uh, same thing. We had a lot of interest in Connecticut in terms of doing it. UConn School of Agriculture was like, you know, yeah. we're in. Um, the um, Actually, the, the tribes, the uh, Native American tribes, were very interested in it. They sort of saw it as a, you know, you know, legacy crop from, you know, the old, you know, Native right, Americans, right, right, exactly. And, uh, but again, the State Department of Agriculture, for, in, you know, whatever reason, they just never put out the regs to implement the program. Um, so anyway, that's where we are today. However, but there's time for a new farm bill right now. So um, knock on wood, when we go back after the election for lame duck session, we will hopefully pass a 2018 farm bill, which will be pretty much what the Senate worked out, which Good bill, but included in that Senate bill is full legalization of industrial hemp. And its chief sponsor and advocate, uh, which may surprise some people in the room here, was Mitch McConnell from Kentucky. Because again, in his sort of state, in terms of what's happening in agriculture, uh, as I said, tobacco farming is just, you know, it is dwindling and it's shrinking. And, um, you know, his folks really need this as a, uh, as a cash crop. As you said, it's simple to grow, an incredible variety of uses. Everything from building materials to oils to um, energy, you know, uses uh, potentially there. So, uh, and it sailed through the Senate. I mean, it, the, the uh, Senate version of the farm bill passed with just a handful of no votes. So, um, you know, we're hopeful that we can really actually get this done um, in December. And it would be, uh, and the interest level locally is, is very, it's not just the tribes. I mean, frankly, the farmers, that, like you said, who are desperate to get new sources of revenue. As far as plant-based, um, you know, again, another development which ha you know was announced just a, a few <coughs> weeks ago was that uh, the administration uh, allowed for um, E15 uh, gas. Okay, that's the so if you pump when you're at the gas pump, you'll see E10, which means that it's 10% ethanol uh, that's that's going in there, and um, they they now are permitting uh, during I forget I think it's either summer or winter. I can't remember one it is exactly. But anyway, to go to E15, which I will tell you, for people who are in the maritime, um, you know, marina sector, they hate ethanol 15 because it really messes up engines. I mean, really, I've, I've had ferocious, you know, uh, calls from people, lawnmowers, snow blowers. I mean, E15 is really, it's not, it's really not a, a great sort of thing. But, the car so. but the corn growers, you know, in Iowa, submarines for, you know, the, the state in terms of, you know, uh, priority and, um, you know, Obama Raising sort of went back and forth on it, but, it, but anyway, it's they, they How much does that raise the cost of corn? For people? Well, that's, and that, to be honest, you're absolutely right, Dave, because it, 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 that drives up the price of corn. And, and, you know, burning food for fuel is just, in my opinion, if we're talking about plant-based, um, you know, uh, renewable energy, we really should try and look at other non-food uh, types of you know, there's things like algae, and I mean, you know it better than I do. I mean, there's just no, but there's, the, and, and that's where re research and tech, you know, development, R&D into, into uh, you know, energy is just, it's so important that, that, you know, we keep our eye on that ball, because there's, there's opportunities out there. And corn really should not be, you know, the ethanol. We should find other ways to do it without affecting food supply. Yeah. Um, I struggle with being an, an, an oh, environmentalist, because I am pro-life. And I do believe in the environment, but as far as politics goes, I, it's hard to support both because of the party lines are so drawn on them two subjects. Well, I, I uh, you know, I, I think it's important not to cross wires, particularly on an issue like the environment. I mean, you know, there are people who, at the end of the day, when they go into the voting booth, you know, that's going to be their, their their predominant issue. And, uh, you, that's, that's really not just you, believe me, it's there are 700,000 people that live in the second congressional district. So, you know, there, there's issues that, you know, when we do town halls or, uh, you know, phone call town halls, um, you know, that, that's something that's important to people in terms of whatever is, is you know, um, in their belief system. And I respect it. And, and I, um, 
you know, it's, to be honest with you, it, it's, as I mentioned earlier, you know, historically, you know, the EPA was created under Richard Nixon. Um, you know, as I said, the fuel efficiency standards was a bipartisan push. You know, Reagan was a big uh, proponent of, of doing that, just again, because energy prices were going through the roof um, back then. And, um, and there are some folks in the, in the you know, in the House uh, Republican caucus, I mean, believe it or not, we do talk to each other. And uh, I have friends, you know, on the other side. And, <laughs> And who, um, particularly, you know, from more sort of coastal, northeastern parts of the country, um, you know, really get it. You know that environmental policy, um, you know, really needs to be uh, broadened. But I, but I would just say that you know the Energy and Commerce Committee is sort of the the, the crux of where energy policy um, gets dealt with, and it has been pretty frustrating, to be honest with you, over the last few years in terms of we just have not been able to get stuff that is, you know, it's just not that difficult, you know, um, in terms of, um, you know, the economy, you know, which is traditionally, that's always been sort of the battle is environmental policy punishes and hurts the economy. But we know now, as I mentioned earlier, the job growth in renewables and, um, you know, the opportunities for, the, you know, like that farm I visited this morning, that, you know, that really is now a false choice. I mean, we can, you can have good, smart environmental policy and still be pro-growth. And, um, but at the end of the day, you know, when you walk in the booth, you know, it, it's, and I respect it. It's you make good choices based on what's your real belief system, and and, um, and hopefully you know the guys. If, if 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 it's not you know if, if you're voting for people you know because of that issue, you hopefully convince those people that you know the environment is, means a lot to you too. And and that's where I'm telling you that you know the calling and writing your member of Congress or or your public officials. Sometimes people dismiss it as not important. I, I just. You know, sitting in that seat, I can just tell you that is not true. You know, people do care. They, they better care about what their constituents are, say, are saying to them. So I encourage you just to, you know, whatever, you know, the, the results are, is just keep sort of your foot on maybe both gas pedals. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. So, um, you know, as I said, some of them you, you can actually address by statute by passing a law, okay? And, and so um, the Clean Power Plant, which is really a very, you know, well thought out, pretty well flushed out, you know, piece of uh, regulation. I mean, I, I think you could convert that into a bill and, and try and sort of, you know, get it sort of moving in, in that direction. The, 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 you know, treaties, international treaties, you know, that's where the executive branch really, if you read the, you know, Article uh, Two Powers. I mean, that's really um, where you know the, the person in the White House, you know, kind of has pretty sweeping uh, position in terms of um, you know making the decision about whether to participate or not participate. And we saw it actually just again last week where the uh, INF Treaty, which is the nuclear uh, intermediate nuclear uh, force treaty, which uh, the president announced, we're withdrawing from that. Again, it's. Um, if there's not a lot that Congress can do to really reverse a decision like that, I mean, we still have the power of the purse. We can still drive policy through budget, um, and, um, and and we can sort of find other ways to sort of, um, you know, without a treaty, uh, you know, try and kind of at least accomplish the same goals as the treaty. So budget, for example, um, you know, we actually did kind of come together, the two sides, and pass a budget, which the president signed, which kind of, you know, protected funding for programs like the Department of Energy and the one that I was telling you about today. I mean, and, and the uh, guy that came out from Colorado was talking about how they actually had a nice little, not a huge increase, but a boost, so that they can actually do more of these programs, like the uh, uh, projects, like the one that we visited um, this morning. So, you know, even though we're not sort of in a clean power plant, you know, law at this point, you know, you can still use the budget um, to sort of still help sort of pushing the cause and tax policy, like the, the, the tax credits. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, if we're gonna address like a, um, any of our representatives on uh, environmental issues, what would you, what sort of platform would you suggest that allows us to be uh, neutral uh, when talking about these issues? Like what, what is most effective um, when speaking to our representatives? 
so um, as I said, you know, the um, you know when I came to Congress, uh, you know, email was kind of uh, pretty uh, uh, you know tiny, and, and now it's exploded. And, and I can just tell you, frankly, since uh, the new administration took over in January of 2017, our email easily doubled. Right? Emma's back there, yeah. and Catalina <laughs> can tell you they, they, they it's, you know man the phones, and um, uh, and it, you know, but it's good. We welcome it, and um, and we really try to be very diligent in terms of responding to people and not with just a thank you for your letter, you know, um, you know keep it in mind kind of thing, but with actually trying to have a dialogue uh, with people. And, and I think the two senators, you know, as well, um, you know, they, they don't discourage people. You know, sometimes people go, I think you agree with me, why should I bother calling or uh, emailing your office? That's wrong. You know, people should just really con constantly, because, you know, you're also looking at volume in terms of what issues are important. I mean, I'll give you the perfect example. The most diligent, persistent, and high volume um, group is the Humane Society, you know, which they are, you know, I mean, and I, I say that with like, you know, a salute. I mean, they, they um, are organized and they, you know, they know their bill numbers on issues, you know, in terms of horse slaughter or, you know, stuff that, that really is important to them. And, um, and they are incredibly um, effective constantly making sure that every member is, is seeing from their district that people are paying them, you know, on these issues. And not just a one-off. I mean, they, they do it really, um, you know, on a, on a pretty regular basis, and, it, and it's extremely effective. You know, uh, we do town halls. You know, we do live town halls. Uh, you know, did a couple in Norwich uh, in the last year or two, and that's another opportunity to get in front of a mic and, you know, make your point. And, um, you know, in that case, you can even maybe have even an additional megaphone because there's press coverage you know that would um, also pick that up and you kind of get that even more out to the public uh, dialogue and then we do telephone town halls you know uh, around the district which uh, the last one we did we had 8,000 people uh, on the call I mean it's uh, it, people like it because it's easy you know you don't have to drive anywhere and, and, um, and then if you don't get a chance to answer your or ask your question during the telephone town hall then you can you know we you can either leave a recording or email afterwards and you know that's another way of so, um, you know, technology has been great. We do an e-newsletter e once a week, which I think one's going out in about an hour, um, you know, every Friday afternoon it's there, and we, we, you know, we get lots of good feedback um, with that. So, um, you know, the nice thing about, you know, technology, hopefully we can protect net neutrality, um, is that, uh, you know, we're, uh, you know, that people really, I think, have, have, it's, it's become more robust in terms of uh, uh, discussion with member offices. There are members who don't respond. You know, I think you know, people should not be sort of turned off or discouraged, and they really should take advantage of that. Uh, and it's free, too, which is really nice. Thank you. Hi. Um, the, uh, recently, the Board of Regents has voiced the opinion that students should be going through community college within two years. Um, for many community college students are non-traditional, and it's very difficult to stay in school full time family and other needs. Uh, how would the federal government and Congress help the families and the actual students during these times if the Board of Regents has a Yeah, I don't get that, you know, uh, idea. I mean, because the genius of community college is that it, it really is something that people uh, who aren't necessarily on a traditional, you know, path in terms of just, you know, K through 12, four years degree, you know, um, has really created an avenue for people to, to really transform themselves. And, um, you know, particularly when, you know, when uh, the president was talking about the workforce needs that are out here, I mean, everybody universally agrees that community colleges are the best tool in the toolbox, you know, for the region in terms of trying to, to uh, you know, get to that goal of, of uh, giving people the skills that the local economy um, needs. So, um, again, the way our system works, these are state institutions, they're state licensed, and, and they're state run. So, um, that, another example where, you know, actually public engagement and, and political engagement is, um, you know, at the, in this election at the state level is critical. And I, and I know this topic has come up um, at the Chamber of Commerce up in uh, Putnam for both the major candidates for uh, governor. And um, so, you know, I know 
people, the advocates have done a good job of sort of raising the, the visibility of, of what you just described. As far as Washington is concerned, I sit on the Education and Workforce Committee. Um, you know, starting in 1965, we had a, a mega piece of legislation called the Higher Ed Authorization Act, uh, which is kind of like the Farm Bill, but it's for uh, higher education. It's supposed to get renewed every five years. The last time we did it was 2008, which is outrageous given you know all the challenges with uh, uh, higher education affordability. There is a bill called the AIM Higher Act, which I'm a co-sponsor of, which we'd be happy to share with you. And one of its provisions is to sort of revive that proposal to make community college free, uh, which the president, you know, prior president had, had put out there. And um, you know that would be a great step forward in terms of just sort of a baseline of affordability uh, that's out there. And um, and again, it's not just sort of a directive. I mean, there's actually ways to finance that uh, program that you know makes it real. There's a lot of other stuff in there about boosting Pell grants and also uh, allowing people to rewrite their interest rates on their Stafford loans, which is criminal what's happening out there in terms of it. I mean, people are paying 8 and 9% interest on government loans that um, you can't refinance unless Congress votes to do it. And um, uh, myself and Senator Warren from uh, Massachusetts actually have companion bills on that refinancing option, which is, um, you know, I'll take that bill before any Rotary Club, Chamber of Con I, you know, that's just, people get that, you know, that you should, you should be able to refinance down a high interest rate. Yeah. Yeah. Incentives are nice, but does Connecticut have any policies that restrict the amount of carbon that big companies produce, or um, have any, hold them to a higher tax rate yeah, actually, than so others? Thank you, so there was a, a program that actually Governor Rell um, joined up with, uh, Reggie, the mm -hmm. regional uh, greenhouse gas initiative, which uh, actually our region, the states got together um, to really um, set up some carbon limits. And um, you know, there, there's some great charts that really show the, the pretty striking progress you know, that the sort of Northeast has made in terms of doing that. California you know, is also sort of going down that path as well. And what, what I like about telling that story is that it was Governor Ralph who, who did it, which was a Republican governor. So it was not a partisan, you know, controversy. It was just a, a recognition that, um, you know, we got to do something if Washington um, isn't going to move on it. And, and and frankly, when you know we passed the, the cap and trade, which I mentioned earlier, you know, the Reggie example was a really good sort of, you know, real life um, rebuttal to a lot of the criticisms that you're going to cripple, you know, um, the economy when you when you do that. I mean, the fact. I think now it's a very popular program with companies in terms of you know helping um, you know bring down uh, carbon emissions. But the problem is, of course, you know the, the issue of carbon emissions, as I said, doesn't follow boundaries. You know, you, you really have to do it more comprehensively nationally. And we can get you information on that, by the way, if you're interested in terms of what Connecticut and the region did. It's it's really actually something to be pretty proud of. Last year there was a lecture in the environmental lecture seminar and um, they brought up the fact that our beaches are eroding away really badly in Connecticut and I think we had paid like something like two million dollars to import a bunch of sand from Cape Cod. Have you heard of any new re uh, legislation about possibly allowing us to pump sand out of the, like the bay and the, uh, the sound? Absolutely. Like that? No, yeah. That's a great question. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, we, we um, obviously border, you know, an incredible body of water, Long Island Sound, which um, uh, we share with, with another state. And uh, our side of the sound, as you point out, um, you know, is really subject to a lot more sort of erosion and also, but also silt buildup um, than New York. It's just the way, you know, the current and, and tidal, you know, motion uh, takes place. So. Um, you know, trying to come up with a viable system of uh, dredging, you know, because some of the waterways, um, you know, the Thames River, I mean, there's, it's places where you can almost walk across it because of the silt buildup that's there. And, you know, frankly, for, um, you know, the, the marina industry, for, for certainly for EV and, and uh, the Navy-based dredging is kind of an existential requirement uh, because it, it, you know, you're just not gonna be able to move anything through there. But that's not the only waterway. There's others that sort of just, you know, we're basically one big watershed in the state of Connecticut with water running you know, into the sound that's there. So the Army Corps of Engineers and EPA 
worked for eight years to come up with a uh, disposal plan to deal with, with dredged material. And in my opinion, did an absolutely brilliant job of getting all the stakeholders at the table. Again, a lot of concerns about open water disposal that you're just polluting, you know, you're just moving pollution from one place to another. That's more pristine. And then they, you know, put some really rigorous testing to sort of extract um, any kind of, um, you know, hazardous materials and treat that with containerized disposal, you know, just like you would any other hazardous substance. Uh, but also to really promote what, what you asked about, which is uplink disposal, to so to use it for beach restoration, to, um, you know, again, marsh restoration, you know, places where clean fill that you're, you're dredging and material can be um, uh, disposed of in a way that restores uh, the coastline. And um, so it got passed. It was right at the end of the Obama administration. Um, again, every stakeholder group, you know, Lots of Republicans. It was not a partisan thing at all. It was just this very kind of you know practical problem that you had to sort of work your way through. And at the last minute, Governor Cuomo uh, withdrew from the deal, and it's now in federal district court. And uh, Connecticut has actually joined with EPA and the Army Corps to defend the plan, which um, I think we should. Um, and, uh, and I'm frankly pretty enraged at, at New York's uh, behavior on this thing because they were at the table at every step of the way. There's also, I mean, there's a fail-safe mechanism that's built into it. So if there's a if there's a plan to dispose of it in open waters, because again, the, the volume sometimes can be more than upwind can, can really absorb. Um, there's what's called a regional disposal team that would review the plan. So New York would have a, a representative of that team, Connecticut, you know, the agencies that are involved in it. And so you know, there, there really would be very um, strict oversight to make sure that you're not putting you know, bad stuff Unfortunately, now it's in the hands of a judge, so which is going to get, I think, argued probably sometime at the end of this year. So it's pretty important for Connecticut to get that thing up and running. Actually, why did he? Um, why did he? Stand? I mean, to be honest with you, it, it's it's a mystery, you know, to people because it was, uh, you know, some people try to present, oh, it's Trump, you know, it's the Trump EPA. It wasn't the Trump EPA. <laughs> it was Kurt Spaulding, who was the Region One guy from, from that Obama, mm -hmm. who was from Rhode Island, and uh, you know, it's not going to do anything. To One more, and if you don't have one, you're not going to hurt my feelings. But okay, Dave, yeah, yeah, sure. You, you talked before about that, that, that was a question asked about uh, incentives to, uh, you know, the federal government isn't going to get involved in climate uh, change uh, mitigation, uh, uh, incentivizing individuals like the farmers and things like that. But it seems to me, though, that there are state, that this, it's going to fall on the state. Respectable, it, it isn't where it was a few years ago when you were in the legislature. Um, but uh, it, it seems to me that there, should, there could be federal incentives to states like there are to individuals to, to, to move to regional uh, type of projects like the, like the Reggie that we have for New England. Uh, uh, has there been anything in Congress in, in that direction and usually incentivize states to, to, to have policies on this? I mean, I can sort of point to, um, you know, sort of almost anecdotal examples of that. I and mean, one of the big things for farms, uh, the guy, the place we visited today was pretty small, so the compost heating system, you know, it was a perfect fit, and it, and it, you know, really did the trick for, you know, the footprint that he has there. But there are bigger farms in Eastern Connecticut, uh, Fairview Farms up in Woodstock, which you know has almost a thousand head of cattle or, or cows up there. I mean, they produce tremendous amounts of manure uh, there, and uh, they actually are trying to put together a biodigester, which actually would produce energy, not just for the farm, but actually for other farms and possibly even for the town uh, that's out there. And it's, uh, the, the technology is there. So USDA, uh, uh, rural development, you know, has been really engaged in, it, in trying to get that project off the ground. Uh, it's, it's complicated in terms of just how you deal with the rate setting system, you know, in terms of you know, energy getting sold up, you know, back to, to the grid. Massachusetts and Vermont are actually light years ahead of us in terms of biodigester uh, projects, and um, uh, 
and frankly, I think it's another place where the new governor and the Steve Commission can really kind of, you know, kickstart, you know, an initiative uh, like that. In terms of, you know, again, incentivizing regional, um, it's hard for me to, to see, you know, this administration doing it. Um, again, we would have to do it in terms of just, uh, you know, trying to either through budget or, or statute, you know, really push, um, you know, that kind of a, a, a uh, makes or sense. Or That's right, yeah. Um, we'll see what happens in you know, 11 days now. We'll wait. We can talk again because the world's going to maybe look a little different. So. Anyway, thank you, Deborah, thank for the opportunity.